than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ to greater riches than treasures in Egypt. He owned them all because he was likely to be the next Pharaoh. For he looked at the reward. 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And we said that the importance of that is it taught them that they need to be under the blood themselves. They need salvation. It's not just the Egyptians who are bad people. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and they needed to learn that. So it was a gospel event, looking forward to the cross. And then verse 29. By faith, they passed through the, the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. And I would like to say a brief prayer and begin our time. Lord, help us tonight. Encourage us in your word. Lord, give us faith. We thank you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I've continued to try and give you a definition or two or three or four simply of what faith is. It is faith is dependence on God. Faith is trust in God. Faith is taking God at his word and obeying him. And faith is deeming God worthy of our worship and devotion, even when we don't, what? Even when we don't understand what he is doing. Because that's a portion of what faith is. It's like, what? I never saw this. This doesn't make sense. I don't have any word from God about what I should do tomorrow. What should I do when I'm in the, you know, the waiting room or I'm in uh, the, the funeral parlor, whatever? I still deem God worthy of my devotion and love no matter what, which is what Job did, and that's what we should do. And for today, the text we're looking at is how they traveled through the Red Sea. It's simply, how do I have faith when I am cornered to such a degree that there is no place to turn? I would like for you to think what it would have been like for the children of Israel when they came to the Red Sea, and I believe it would have been in the middle of the Gulf of Aqaba, Akiba, excuse me. So if you think of the two branches of the Red Sea, think of the one that's further to the east rather than the left, the one that's away from Egypt. About right in the middle of that body of water is where we believe they would have uh, traveled through the Red Sea and then went into the land of Arabia and then up north, Edom, Moab, and then into Israel after about 40 years. So it took them uh, several days to get where they were traveling, four, five, or six days. Believe it or not, they traveled about 200 miles. It was a long trip, and they must have been traveling really, really fast. And, And by the way, some people say that they could not have crossed the Red Sea because you couldn't travel that 200 miles in the few days that they had. But we believe they got there because the Bible says they did. So don't have any problem with that. Maybe they traveled day and night. Maybe they were afraid. You know, maybe they recognized that Pharaoh was chasing them and he's got horses and they're walking. So they had a lot of motivations to make some pretty good time traveling to the Red Sea. Oddly enough or strangely enough, the Lord led them right into a corner, right into a place as they travel through a wadi. And and a wadi is like a, a mountain pass, They traveled through this mountain pass several miles, and they came to the beach. The name of the wadi was Water, not water like we would think of, but Water. And they came onto this beach, and as they were there on the beach, they realized, whoops, we are in big, big trouble. We have just walked ourselves, or the Lord has just led us onto this beach, and there are mountains on every side and water in front of us, and Pharaoh is behind us, so we are in big trouble. And God delivered. And the important thing for us to reflect on that tonight in terms of a lesson, just as we're beginning, is sometimes the trials that God sends to our lives, sometimes they come right after a big victory. Because that's where they were. They they had to be as high as a horse in terms of their excitement. That the Lord, after all of these years, 430 years, has delivered them from the land of Egypt. And so they're so excited about it, and they're heading down the road, and and they were paupers, they were slaves in Egypt. How did they leave? They left as kings and queens. 
they plundered the riches of Egypt. Uh, when the Egyptians saw them going, here, please take my gold. Here, please take my silver. Just go. So everything that they could give them, they gave them. And so they're just on this super high spiritual uh, plane of that this is just wonderful and God is so great. And all of a sudden, another challenge comes their way, and it is the challenge of the Red Sea. The crossing of the Red Sea in the Scripture is a, an extremely important event, almost as important as the Exodus itself, which is you know, what the Lord did to get them out of Egypt, because the Lord always goes back many, many times in the Old Testament and says, you can trust in me. And the reason that you can trust in me is because when Israel had its back against the wall or against the sea and there was no place to turn, there was nothing to do and no hope of ever even surviving, they, they were going to be like, what, pigs in a barrel? That's not pigs in a barrel, fish in a barrel. That when all you could do is shoot them and pick them off and kill them and it would be like target practice. At that very moment, the Lord came and rescued them. And you've got to believe that the Lord will do that for you and for me also. Now, I don't know how, I can't give you the particulars, but it was by faith that they waited on God, and it was by faith that God acted and rescued and delivered them and made a name for himself that is so great that all he would have to do is say, you think you can trust in me? Look what I did back there. Because I did that, you can know that I will take care of you in the future. It's such a great event, by the way, the crossing of the Red Sea, that most people other than believers don't believe that it even happened. So it's just not a real event, they would say. It's, it's part of that myth of, of the nation of Israel. Um, one really famous Egyptian archaeologist said, really, it's just a myth. That was the way that he said it. And he says, sometimes archaeologists, as archaeologists, we just have to say that it never happened. And that's what he believes, that it just never happened. And the reason he says that it didn't happen is because, according to him, there, is no, there, there are no, there is no archaeological evidences of the crossing of the Red Sea. But, you know, there probably are. And we've looked at some of them in the past, but even if there were evidences of the crossing of the Red Sea, it wouldn't change their opinion one single bit. And it wouldn't change mine either because I don't believe because of the evidence and I don't disbelieve because of a lack of evidence. I believe what I believe because it's in the Word of God. Uh, here's how they explain it. Did you know that maybe a volcano blew off in an island that wasn't too far away from Egypt and as the lava flowed from the island, somehow it did something to the Red Sea? Or maybe there was something sort of like a seish. I don't know if you've ever heard of those. Well, apparently we had one here 30, 40 years ago, a long time ago, um, I've heard of people that were able to walk out into the bay in the downtown area for several hundred yards on dry land. So maybe it was a seish. Um, that's what some people say along the way. Uh, here's my most favorite one of all of them, that it was really a mirage. And so as the Egyptians came over the hill, they looked down at the Israelites, they had a mirage and they believed that the Israelites had gone into the sea, and as the Israelites looked back at the Egyptians, they had a mirage, a mirage, excuse me, and they believed that the, the Egyptians had fallen into the sea. So both the Israelites and the Egyptians from the other perspective, some people say, um, actually were in the sea and they weren't. The reality is, is there are many books in the Bible, not just Exodus, um, not just Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy that talk about the crossing of the Red Sea. And so if God is mentioning it all over the place in the Bible, then we ought to believe that it happened exactly as they've said. Um, if you have a study Bible, I'm not trying to read whether or not you do, um, many Christians are beginning to doubt or change their opinion of the crossing of the Red Sea because the Hebrew word for Red Sea is really reed sea, R-E-E-D, as in reeds that grow in the water. And uh, many have said, well, there was a reed sea that was north of the Red Sea, and so maybe that's where they traveled. And of course, it doesn't take a, a lot of imagination to say that it's pretty amazing that they were able to cross in knee-deep and waist-deep water, and the Lord drowned the whole army of the Egyptians in waist-deep water. 
Um, they didn't travel through the Reed Sea. They did travel through the Red Sea. And I'm going to give you some evidences about that uh, before we finish up here tonight. Um, in the book of Isaiah, we are told, by the way, that the water was deep. Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 13. We are told in Psalm 78 and verse 13 that the water stood high like a wall and that it was a wonderful thing. We are told in the book of Acts in Stephen's speech that it was a sea, a large sea along the way. We are told that the Red Sea in the Bible will become the lower border of the nation of Israel. And so if it was the Reed Sea, it doesn't even fit into the promises that God made to them. I think most striking in terms of which area they crossed uh, can be defended or defined by this. When Israel went north to Kadesh Barnea, remember they went up there and 12 spies went to spy on Canaan, 10 were bad and 2 were good. What do you think they saw in Canaan? Uh, 10 were bad and 2 were good. They, they, because of their unbelief, were told to turn south. And so God told them, you cannot go into the land of Canaan and you have to go south, guess where they went? They went down beside the Red Sea. And if the Red Sea was in Egypt as the Reed Sea, which is, is what some people are saying, that would suggest that after Kadesh Barnea, that they went all the way back to the land of Egypt and wandered around Egypt for 40 years. Now, we know they didn't do that. We know that they were around Edom and Moab and over on the Arabian Peninsula. We know where Mount Sinai is. Mount Sinai is in Arabia, would be on the east side of the, well, if you think of, of those two, you have the, the, the long uh, sea there, and then you have the branch that goes up by the Nile River, and then you have the other branch that goes up and is connected to uh, there would be the Jordan River and the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. That was the one that they spent all of their time. So to your right, I hope I'm getting this right, to your right on the, the right side, uh, that's where they spent their time by the Red Sea. Now it's striking that as they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, uh, there are multiple places where they traveled and they were by the Red Sea and then they traveled and they spent a long time and then they came to a new city or a new region and guess where they were? They were by the Red Sea, and then they traveled to a new region and came to a new place, and they camped by the Red Sea, and it happens all over the place that they're camping by the Red Sea. And again, if that would have been the Reed Sea up in Egypt, that would have made no sense because we know where Goshen is, and we know where many of the places where they were. Um, and so what, what does that mean? Well, it would be like this. Um, if my family decided that we were going to go camping and, and we were all the way over to the Sioux Locks and we, we drove up by Whitefish Point and we went camping by Lake Superior. And then we got in our car and we decided to move east or, or west, excuse me, a little bit. And then we came uh, to Munising and then we went by this big body of water and it was Lake Superior. And we drove over to Lantz and we found that there was a really nice campground just a little bit east of town there. And we camped by Lake Superior, and then we went to uh, Wisconsin, and then we camped all the way over to Duluth, and all of those were camping by Lake Superior. So all of the examples of the many different cities that they were camping by, each of them was near the Red Sea, implying that they were going up and down the border all over the place uh, in the peninsula and to the east by the Red Sea. And so it was Elim, and then they journeyed uh, to Mount Seir, and then they came to Edom, and then they came to Isran, Geber, and then they came to Elath. These are all different verses, and each one of them, which was near the Red Sea, which was near the Red Sea, which was near the Red Sea. So after the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, they journeyed three days towards Marah, and then Elim, and then leaving Elim, they camped by the Red Sea. And so after five days of crossing the Red Sea, they will, were still near the Red Sea. So here's the point about just trying to establish that it's not some local river that was, or local lake that was north in Egypt. In every case where we can identify a region connected with the account of the Red Sea, it was always a body of water which was without exception 
to be identified with the big water that they would know as the Red Sea. And, and just for fun, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but it's still true, um, in 1 Kings chapter 9, we're told that Solomon built a huge navy, and guess which river or sea or lake or body of water he put it by? He put it by the Yam Suf, translated Reed Sea or Red Sea, and he established his navy there. Now, he's a pretty smart fellow, and I doubt that he would be establishing a navy in waist-deep water just outside of Egypt. Think about how silly that would be. So we know absolutely certain that the water that we would look to is the water, uh, is the place where God blessed and protected his people. So with that in mind, I want to go ahead and give you about five lessons, five things that we could learn from what God did to the nation of Israel as he rescued them not only from Egypt, but also from the certain destruction by Pharaoh and his armies. And the first one is simply, have faith in God. That's really what that's all about. Have faith in God. It's going to work out. God has not lost track of you. God isn't going to go to all of the effort of the ten plagues in Egypt and enjoying the, the deliverance of the nation of Israel and get them all the way out of town just to see them destroyed by the very people that he had just virtually destroyed in the land of Egypt. I need to have faith in God, and I need to not doubt his wisdom, his goodness, his powers, his abilities, and his intentions to watch over me no matter what. The second lesson from the crossing of the Red Sea is that it's not time to panic, because God is an awesome God. And the times that we see the most awesome characteristics of God are always in the worst of circumstances. You know, if, if nothing bad or difficult ever happened to anybody of the children of Israel, we wouldn't know how great and how good and how kind and how, how wonderful our God is. But he, he allowed them to be in this situation so that we could learn, so that they could learn that God is an awesome God. And the sadness for the nation of Israel is once they get over the Red Sea, does it really settle into their hearts that we can trust in God and not have to worry? And so they would never complain again and they would never grumble and they would never want to go back to Egypt? Not at all. All the time they were forgetting the goodness of God and the two things about him that they were forgetting. Number one, the exodus in which God rescued them from Egypt, and the other really great thing was the deliverance of the children of Israel through the middle of the Red Sea. It would have been such an amazing thing to think about what that would have been like to be walking through uh, that region. Um, many archaeologists believe, who are, who are looking for um, the Red Sea crossing, that there does seem to be a place where we could say, like, I'm going to give it like a 75% likelihood that this is the place where they cross through the Red Sea. There is a pillar on this side of the body of water that describes from the time of Solomon what the nation of Israel did. And there's a pillar on the other side of the water that matches. The two pillars are identical to each other. And they describe and identify that this is the place where the children of Israel crossed over. Uh, when you look through uh, the water depths, that's one area where there was a land bridge where the water was not nearly as deep in other places. So again, it makes sense. The beach is there. Uh, some of the towns around that region are named after Moses. They're named after the children of Israel, and they identify that that would have been the place where it was. The third lesson that I want to give you, in addition to what we've already said, is simply this that it's important to believe that God fights for his people. You're God's child. And assuming that that's true, and I'm going to assume that that's true, I hope that that's true. If you are God's child, then he takes it personally when people act against him, when people act against his children. How do I demonstrate that? Or can I think of any time in history where the Lord said to someone, uh, when you persecute them, you're persecuting me. It's kind of a hint, like Sunday's sermon, when the Lord was talking to Saul of Tarsus, why are you persecuting me? 
So when, when the, the Christians were being persecuted by Saul of Tarsus, in, in a very real sense, they were persecuting God himself. Or Saul was persecuting God himself. The same thing is true here, that God fights for his people, and you are not alone. And God will not forget if it's persecutions, if it's difficulties, if it's what's happening up in Canada with the churches up there. Um, they're not going to get away with that. I, you know, I'm not saying that I know all of the rights and wrongs and the ins and outs of, of how every situation should play itself out and, and how we should act. I, I think that's a delicate situation. Each church needs to decide. But when they arrest a pastor and put him in jail and put fences around the church, that is way overboard. And somebody will answer for that both now and in eternity. Unless they repent of their sins. Unless they, they say, oh, well, we realize that we should have done something different. God fights for his people is the fourth lesson. Um, third lesson, excuse me. The fourth lesson right below it is simply this. That it is in times like this or these when we have our backs up against the wall that we give God an opportunity. And, and that sounds a little too human-centered. Let me say that differently. God takes those opportunities when our backs are against the wall, to make a name for himself. And so it's so important for us to not panic and not give up and not doubt because part of what God is doing is coming and is establishing, this is who I am. So could you have an opportunity in a trial that you may face within the next six months or a year, be that public voice, where God is honored and glorified. If I could just mention James Coates again, uh, his wife, Erin Coates, um, when he was in prison, she was able to be interviewed by a lot of different people, gave these great testimonies, talked about the Lord, talked about salvation. Uh, the same thing for James. And in our lives, the same thing is true, that those are opportunities for God to glorify himself through our lives. And on the day of our final judgment before the Lord, he's going to reward us for the way that we responded in times of difficulty and trial as we gave him opportunities to, it, as Peter says, it will result in praise and glory and honor on that day. Listen to some examples of this very thing, how that God makes a great name for himself through the crossing of the Red Sea. This is in Joshua chapter 2 when the spies are talking. And she says, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen upon us and all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. So that would be the people of Jericho. So they all are having a fear of God, maybe not a saving fear of God, but a fear of God. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And by the way, when did that happen? It wasn't last week or last month. It was, anybody know? Just for fun? 40 years ago. Put a big zero there. 40 years ago, maybe it's 40 like this, I'm not even sure. Um, they knew what God did, and they're still afraid of God and what he did uh, to deliver the children of Israel. I'll read a little bit further. We heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites. Uh, let me read another one. In Psalm chapter 66 and verses 5 and 6, come and see the works of God. So this is an invitation by the psalmist to give you an opportunity to worship him. I need reasons on this next Sunday. Um, to have my heart stirred with, with thoughts of the grandeur of God. He is awesome in his doings towards the sons of men. He turned the sea into the dry land, and they went through the river on foot. There we will rejoice in him. Psalm 74, For God is my king from old, working salvation in the midst of the earth, you divided the sea by your strength, and you broke the head of the sea serpent in the waters. Psalm 106, verse 7. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies. They rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea, 
Nevertheless, he saved them for, for what? For his namesake, that he might make his mighty power known to them. Psalm 104, verse 7. At your rebuke, the waters fled. Think about that. God said something, and they went running as scared as rabbits. At your rebuke, the waters fled. At the sounds of your thunder, they took flight. Psalm 77, 19 and 20. Your way was in the sea, and your path in the great waters, and your footsteps were not known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses. And he's describing it as if, well, here's the way we think of the the crossing of the Red Sea. We think that Moses stuck down his rod and then everybody followed him or followed Aaron through. The Bible doesn't really picture it that way. The Bible pictured it as someone else went through. In Habakkuk chapter 3, it tells us who it was. You, this is God, the Lord, you walked through the sea with your horses through the heaps of great waters. And when I heard, my body trembled and my lips quivered at the voice. And he goes on to describe other elements of what that would feel like. He's saying it like this, that leading the children of Israel through the Red Sea was not Moses and not just Aaron, but it was God. And it's as if like a bunch of policemen who were mounted on horses as they walk through the crowd, the crowd parts this way. God was parting the water and leading them through the Red Sea by his power and by his grace. And I'm not even done yet. Psalm 114. When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from the people of a strange land, Judah became his sanctuary and Israel his dominion. So God's presence is there. And the sea saw and fled and Jordan turned back. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 15 through 19. The Lord is knocking on her door and he's introducing himself and he says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinguished. They are quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. And he goes on to describe what his future is going to be like. And the future power of God and his deliverance for the nation of Israel will be greater than what he did in the past. It's sort of like this. Here's the way, this is Isaiah 43. Oh, you think that was great? Watch this. And he'll do further things in the future. And so we are inclined or persuaded or encouraged to look back and think of the great things of God and say, well, I know that the future will be even better. And then the last one that I would say in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 13, and Moses said to the people, and and this is our lesson too, do not be afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will see them again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And so I know that God is a God who makes his name great and uses the crossing of the Red Sea to teach us several things. Now, we've done this whenever we looked at Exodus and all, all that was there, and we said that it's all a picture of something. Uh, Egypt is a picture of the world before salvation. And uh, the Passover is a picture of the cross and salvation. And so you come to the Red Sea, which is going through water, and we would say, I wonder what that might actually be a picture of. If If Egypt is before salvation and Passover is when a person comes to faith and the wilderness, that 40-year time period is a picture of the Christian life, right? And the promised land is a picture of heaven. Then I think it is really clear, and most people believe that it's true, that crossing through the Red Sea was a picture of Christian baptism and what we do when we go through the waters and we identify with the people of God and leave the old life behind 
and enter into a new life. Again, when you think about what baptism is, baptism is a way to say that the old me is gone and, and the past is over. And so just as the Lord said, you will never see the Egyptians again, I will never want to go back and never intend to go back into the old life, but only live in the, in the life that God has given me. One final lesson, and this is the last one from the crossing of the Red Sea, and it is simply this. What do we do when we face extreme temptations? Well, we could run like a bunch of cowards. We could give in to our sinfulness. We could complain. We could fear. By the way, when Moses says, be not afraid, I'm assuming that that means something, that they probably were afraid. And nine out of 10 people in the room here tonight, had we been there on the beaches uh, waiting to see what was going to happen, I would have been afraid. And you would have been afraid. But we're told from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in verses 11 to 14, why did these things happen? Now, all of these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. But God is, is what? You need to remember the faithful. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able, but with the temptation will make a way of escape. Now please remember, what does that mean in verse 13 when he talks about a way of escape? He talked about what happened to Israel in the wilderness. And so the way of escape that he is alluding to here, Paul is alluding to, is none other than the parting of the Red Sea to get them out of the land of Egypt forever. He is saying that your temptations, no matter what they are, are as easy for God to part, and he can make a way of escape just as easy or easier for you than as easy as it was for him to part the Red Sea. And I like to think about this when I think about the works of God. Um, nothing that God does is hard for him at all. It's a piece of cake. It's cakewalk. If he can part the Red Sea, can you trust and believe that he can break up your temptation and your trial and get you through? He made a way back then. He will make a way today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the night. I pray that you would help us the next time we feel like our backs are up against a wall and there's nowhere to turn and the armies of Pharaoh are bearing down upon us and it looks like we are we're toast there's nothing left remind us again lord that you are such a great god and and you repeatedly continually bragged as you should brag about your power to deliver your people and we should and we should continually be grateful and honor you and praise you and glorify you and trust you because of your ability to step into our lives and make a way of escape. We thank you for it, and we praise you. We thank you, Lord, that you responded to the faith of your people, because that's what Hebrews says. By faith, they crossed through. And so, even if they were a, a little bit cautious, maybe even fearful of, this is the strangest thing we've ever seen, it was still their faith that led them through the water as they followed your horses and as they followed Moses to a land of deliverance. Help us, Lord, when we fear to walk by faith too. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.